Inspired by his rural upbringing, Ted Hughes's poem Hawk Roosting is about a violent, arrogant, dictatorial bird. But of course you would know that already if you'd watched part one of my analysis of this poem. There in part one I read the poem, I went through its context and I started to analyse the poem too. So if somehow you're watching part two first, I do recommend that you go and watch part one first instead because that way this video is going to make so much more sense. If you've already watched part one, excellent. In this video I'm going to finish analysing the poem, think about its themes and go through the poem's meaning, mood and the poet's motivation. So with all that out of the way, here is part two. So I finished the last video on this stanza, the penultimate or second last stanza of the poem. There were three questions there that I wanted you to consider. So hopefully you've had time to do that because in just a moment you're going to be seeing some of my ideas and my annotations in response to those questions. So Liam in the video, back over to you. So I think that there are two equally valid interpretations to the line, the allotment of death, and that they are both interesting and worth commenting on. First, Allotment can mean giving out. So this line could be seen to be about the distribution of death, which could emphasize the hawk's power and arrogance and near godlike status. On the other hand, an allotment can be a plot of land used for growing fruits and veg and flowers. In this interpretation then, the hawk is growing death. There's juxtaposition between allotment and death then, which is ironic and shows the hawk's preoccupation with murder. The middle two lines of this stanza are about how the hawk flies in a straight path with nothing being able to stop it. This is reflected in the poem by the use of enjambment because when we read these lines, they should flow continuously, just like the hawk's flight path. This shows the hawk's power, because not even poetry and language can control it. We have another image of murder in this poem. The hawk kills without mercy, simply because other creatures are getting in its way. It flies, after all, directly through the bones of the living. This further shows, then, that the hawk thinks it has power over life and death. After all, it kills where it pleases. And here we have the poem's final stanza. And to go with it, we have one, two, three, four fairly straightforward questions. So read them, have a think, make some notes. You know the drill by now. So the hawk suggests that the sun, and therefore the most powerful thing in the whole of nature, is supporting it. The sun is, after all, behind the hawk. This implies that it is natural and right and proper for the hawk to have so much power. I end stopping each line in this stanza, which is just a way of saying by having full stops at the end of each line. Hughes has ended the poem with a series of straightforward statements. This hints at the hawk's confidence as well as its power and control, whilst also making this final stanza sound something like a political manifesto, that document where political parties set out what they are going to do if elected. The newly highlighted words or phrases indicate the hawk's power. The fact that the hawk does 
as it pleases and will not be swayed by anything or anyone reinforces the idea that it is like a dictator. The poem begins and ends with lines that start with I. This repetition, especially at either end of the poem, shows us that the hawk talks about itself a lot. It is very egotistical. Before we get too excited and move on, it's worth looking at the poem as a whole as we consider its form and structure. There are one, two, three questions in particular that I think are worth talking about. And well, there they are, they're on screen now. So have a read of them, have a think, maybe make some of your own notes first and share them with me down in the comment section. By using the dramatic monologue form, Hughes is placing the reader of the poem in a powerless position. As the speaker of the poem, the hawk, addresses the audience who are unable to respond. The stanzas of this poem are nice and regular. Each one is four lines long, but simply noticing that isn't enough. Never just feature spots in your essays. And by that I mean, don't just say each stanza has four lines. That it's not analysis, it's not enough. So you need to make a comment too. I would argue that this regularity of structure shows that the hawk has been controlling the stanzas of the poem. And by having such uniformity, Hughes is showing that the hawk has power over poetry and language. So really Hughes is emphasizing just how total the hawk believes its power is. The hawk in this poem is free, and that is shown in how Caesura and enjambment are used in this poem. The hawk is not rigidly bound by the constraints of lines and starts and stops ideas and sentences wherever it pleases. Again, this reinforces the idea of the hawk having power over poetry and language. And that is the whole poem analysed in depth. Now we are going to consider the three M's of the poem, and if that means nothing to you, I recommend that you have a quick look at the second video in this series, which is for Simon Armitage's poem, The Manhunt. If I've worked YouTube correctly, a link for that video should be appearing on screen about now. So there is my summary of the poem's meaning. At a surface level, I actually think this poem is quite straightforward. It's about a hawk that observes the natural world. Uh, the hawk's arrogant and almost tyrannical. It discusses killing, how it's God's masterpiece and how it holds total power over the world around it. The hawk could be seen as a metaphorical representation of dictators and bullies, or it could just be a hawk. So there's my summary of the poem's mood. I've said that monosyllabic language, such as I kill or I please, creates an eerily calm or emotionally detached tone in the poem, which, surprise, surprise, makes a hawk sound like a psychopath. And of course, the tone is also quite violent at times, as seen in quotations such as hooked head. And that is what I think may have been Hughes's motivation for writing the poem. Notice in the second mini paragraph that I have used more tentative language, so could be. Tentative language is something that you might want to use in your own writing, as it opens up the possibility of you discussing multiple interpretations. Here we have a theme table, and again, I've explained what this is all about in the second part of my analysis of the manhunt. In short, you need a table, those themes up top, each anthology poem down the side. So if I was filling out this grid, this is what I might have done. 
I've lost track of the amount of times that I've said the words power or control in these two videos. So yeah, this poem is definitely about power. This poem is about a hawk and its role in nature, so yeah, the poem is about nature. I've had students tell me before that this poem could be considered a love poem, as the hawk is massively arrogant and is maybe in love with itself. That's not wrong, and so I was tempted to tick the box, but in this case I sort of decided maybe not quite. Although there is violence and maybe an allusion to the Nazi party, I don't think that this is exactly a war poem, and nor would I say it's a time poem, nor a place poem, nor a, a man poem. Man is actually curiously absent in this poem. On the other hand, death features quite heavily in this poem, as there is a lot of killing. Death has been presented as something natural, as well as maybe something to savour. I had to think about whether or not I was going to tick the religion box. The hawk is so powerful that it sort of thinks itself to be like a god, and certainly more powerful than the Christian god. You could write a very interesting outside of the box essay for religion that is about this poem. On the other hand, I could also agree with you if you put a cross in this box. So those are my thoughts about the themes that could apply to this poem. But what do you think? Please do let me know how you would fill out this grid in the comments section down below. For this poem, I've provided quite a straightforward revision task. I thought I'd leave it to you to decide if you were going to use mind maps or lists or tables for this one. Use whichever method suits you best. And if you don't know which method suits you best, experiment. Each theme that you just ticked in your theme grid should have its own mind map, list, table, whatever. For each theme, I think you'd find it useful to pop down as many quotations as you can that are relevant to that theme. And you might even find it useful to briefly explain how the quotations are relevant. Nice and easy this one, but theme work and quotation work are so important. Knowing the poems and knowing how they might apply to different themes is so, so useful as the questions you're going to be getting in your exam are most likely going to be about themes. And that is hawk roosting done. Well done to you for making it this far. If you think this video has helped you, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a like. And why not subscribe to my channel too and turn on that notification bell. I've got lots more GCSE content coming up and if that can help you to succeed in your GCSEs, let it. Do drop a comment too. You're welcome to add in any of your own bits of analysis or to ask me any questions that you might have about this poem. Adding a comment also helps me with the YouTube algorithms. If this video has helped you, then you can help me to help even more people by liking, commenting, etc. So it will be recommended to even more people. I really do hope that you have an awesome rest of the day. And remember to take frequent short breaks as you revise. Because a burned out student is not a happy or successful student. So when is a hawk not just a hawk? Well, a hawk is not just a hawk when it could be symbolising playground bullies, dictatorships, or maybe even the Nazi party.